Payments, payment method innovation in the gaming industry. Moderated by Joseph F. Borge, WH Partners. I'd like to, without further ado, to start immediately because we have very limited time. Um, I'd like to introduce briefly my panelists. Um, Erika Federis, who is an associate at CMS. Um, uh, Andreas Glarner, partner, MME Partners. Uh, Elton Demek, who is uh, managing director, Moneybyte. And uh, Luis Felipe Maya, who is uh, um, um, the partner at FYMSA. So, Probably the biggest uh, challenge in the gaming industry revolves around payments right now. And uh, is, this, is this the only reason we need to seek uh, innovative payment solutions in the gaming industry? Anyone would like to start? Um, sure. Um, so I think there's probably been a little bit of an uptick in terms of um, gaming and um, the virtual world, um, particularly because of the pandemic and the brutal lockdowns that most of us around the world have been subject to. So I think a lot of people are probably looking for social engagements um, through gaming. And with that, I think there is a global reach. And with a global reach, there is going to be a need to... Uh, find a more streamlined and a more innovative payment solution because people around the world are not going to want to pay in the same way. So for instance, perhaps in the West, um, the, the preferred method of payment in, in gaming, I think is subscription models, whereas in other parts of the world, perhaps in Philippines or India will be more micro payments. So I think because of that, we need to find a way to streamline the payments industry and to find a way to remove the friction between different parts of the world and how people, um, uh, make payments in gaming. Andreas? Yeah, I, I fully agree. I think uh, one of the key elements is uh, facilitation of easy and low-cost cross-border payments. And, and, and I think that's one of the key elements uh, for the future to adhere to that. And the other element, uh, in my view, is uh, if you look at the development of user behaviors and how those type of new assets are being used uh, that those can be integrated into gaming as well. Luis? Uh, when you talk about grey markets such as Brazil, uh, payments is uh, of huge importance. Uh, we don't have local payments, we also have to make cross-border uh, payments, uh, and then we have uh, uh, no regulation about it at first. Uh, and most companies struggle on how to get their money out of Brazil and how to pay prizes to players in Brazil. So I think this is something uh, that furthermore, uh, further in the discussion we can talk about. I agree. The gaming industry has always been at the forefront of um, innovating the, the payments method available to, to their players. So um, uh, th this innovative way of allowing the, the players alternative means of um, uh, attracting deposits has always been, I dare to say, that has become mandatory for the gaming industry to explore certain ways and means of innovating the ways of uh, attracting new players from different markets. Maybe, we, we all agree, I believe that maybe the most innovative payment method that we are seeing is through cryptocurrencies. And I'd like to start with Andreas for one particular reason, because he was the guy who introduced me professionally to the world of cryptocurrencies and blockchain back in 2016. Together and separately, we have worked on a number of projects in the space of gaming and gambling uh, that were uh, trying to create some, uh, something new, um, some new token, some new platform based on blockchain. However, unfortunately, only a handful of them can be considered uh, successful to date. Uh, one particular case in Malta is uh, um, a consensus with its uh, platform Virtue Poker, which is a P2P poker platform that managed to get a license here. Um, but very few um, have actually had that success. Um, 
what what do you believe is the reason for this andreas okay well well thank you for the question joe um you know, in, in a very short time we, we have here, it's probably a bit, uh, we can't dive into death, what, what the reasons are, but to sum up, I, maybe you should rephrase the question slightly and ask, well, what are the lessons learned if you look back on the past seven years, um, why it did not take off uh, on, a, on a mass scale, as, as we may have believed when we discussed the first time in 2016 at was. So, uh, um, I, I think, obviously, this is oversimplifying things a bit, but um, I, I believe we have kind of three lessons that we, we have learned. Uh, lesson one is, in my point of view, uh, most cryptocurrencies or, or digital assets we currently see on the market and which have a, you know, a market relevance, they not designed as means of payment, even though you know Bitcoin originally was designed as a means of payment, um, they don't have the qualifications for that. They're too volatile, um, and their transaction costs are simply too high. So this is not working. Obviously, if you look in the future, um, this is a topic which is being you know taken care of. Uh, on one hand, by having much more efficient layer one blockchain protocols, so protocols like LF0, like Solana, like uh, um, Binance uh, chain and other near and, and all these other new blockchains arising now, uh, they solve this efficiency problem on, on the transaction costs. And on the other hand, we see new stable coins arising, um, which are going to get traction on those chains as well, and which is going to, they're going to solve the problem of volatility. So lesson one, lesson number one, hopefully to be solved. Uh, lesson number two for me is uh, that when you look at the applications which try to integrate an in-app token, so uh, many of those games that based on Ethereum is set up a, an application, a layer two smart contract world, which have their own token, which they use to invest, use as a means of investment to finance the development. And um, those type of payment token, they did not work uh, in the past. They did not work outside the gaming industry in other industries. They do not work in the gaming industry now on a large scale. There are always exceptions, of course. Uh, so uh, I think it's simply too complicated to have to deal with various tokens on each transaction. You may need to have ease for the gas and then the, the, the in-game token for the token transactions. Very complicated um, setup. So uh, I think most projects try to avoid that in the future and just have one mean of payment integrated. And, and for me, uh, also relevant, like lesson three, if we look at the regulatory development, obviously uh, cryptocurrency payments has become um, under substantial scrutiny of, of regulators, and not all of those topics which arose in that context have been solved. And, and in particular, the transactions from intermediaries to intermediaries, but also from non-custodial wallets to intermediaries, like a gaming provider, they, in most jurisdictions now, travel rules start to apply. So you need to send along with the transaction information on the transaction itself. Currently, we don't have any protocols which achieve that uh, on a cross-border level. There's some experiments, there's a couple of projects trying to solve that, but we don't have a standard defined uh, throughout the world to, to deal with that. So this is also in the pipeline, once it's solved, uh, I think it makes it easier to do this cross-border transactions between intermediaries in, in the gaming industry as well. Thanks. Um, so there is uh, Elton with us, who uh, is the managing director of one of the leading um, uh, payment service providers for gaming companies that uh, as, uh, accepts uh, cryptocurrency on behalf of operators um, and you moved from the most traditional sector of the financial services industry, banking, and moved into the most innovative one. Um, uh, what uh, have you seen in crypto payments that uh, made you make this move? So I worked in a space where, as many of you know, because I'm sure there are a number of Maltese gaming operators um, uh, as, as the audience, we lived in a world where, as Maltese banks, obviously we're dependent upon banking correspondents that, that decide upon us what sort of business we could take and not take, unfortunately. So taking the route of 
embracing crypto payments direct from a lot of other markets um, uh, within the, the space of crypto, allowing for gaming companies to capture deposits um, uh, in, in a way that can be instantly converted and settled to, to the merchant, allowed um, uh, to solve a particular issue for me um, uh, that gaming companies were um, uh, facing, which is um, the ability to maybe target certain markets that they couldn't do because their own banks, unfortunately, did not allow or their own payment providers had difficulties in target certain, targeting certain markets. So um, uh, as a company, we got licensed here in Malta to be able to service that side of the business, allowing for um, uh, the crypto deposits to be captured and um, uh, allow for the operators to service certain markets um, uh, that they had difficulties in. Personally, um, uh, it was a big challenge to move from a very regulated um, industry, even though the crypto market, the virtual financial assets regulatory framework pre Malta is very robust. Um, I do think that there are instances where we were put in a place where certain regulation um, does not fit within the service that we, we provide. But uh, compared to other jurisdictions, I must say that the regulatory framework here in Malta is, is very robust. So I don't think I went away from banking because of regulation. I went purposely for the innovation that uh, the industry can provide to certain markets, certain industries, certain verticals that unfortunately in the outer world are still seen as high-risk businesses. Erika, um, blockchain is aiming at revolutionizing the fundamentals of the iGaming industry. Um, we have now a new phenomenon, uh, the play-to-earn phenomenon. So uh, it's not just about payments, it's also about actually getting paid to play. Um, in reality, it's not that new as Zynga was doing this years ago. But the difference is that now there, you are being given an asset that you can actually take back and uh, trade on uh, some exchange. Um, uh, and sometimes you also get NFTs by actually playing. Um, tell us something of how this is working and where you see this developing in the coming years. Um, thanks so much for the question and for having me on the panel today. Um, and it's really interesting that you bring up Zinga actually, uh, because yes, you're quite right that it's not a new phenomenon, but the difference is that this time around, there is value in the in-game currency that you earn within a game. So taking for instance, Farmville, um, so there you could buy, buy assets within the game, earn it by playing the game, or you could even pay with fiat money to buy uh, certain pieces of land or equipment or anything else on the game. But with that, you can't actually extract the value of any assets that you have within that game. So the biggest difference is that with NFTs and play to earn is that you can extract the value of the, um, any assets or any equipment that you buy within a game. And that has real life value because you can trade those, um, at those tokens, those assets outside of that game and into the real world. Um, so one of the games that I think is most popular in the play to earn space is Axie Infinity. Um, so for those of you who don't know what it is, it's um, basically kind of like a Pokemon type game where you breed um, little monsters, NFT monsters, and they're, they're super cute. And I think that's why they're so popular. Um, and these monsters are actually NFTs. But with these, um, the way that you play the game is that you use these monsters to um, go on battles or, um, or um, go on quests and you can breed them. And by doing that, you then earn t uh, tokens in return. So those tokens are uh, uh, called smooth love potions. Um, so the way that I was talking about extracting value earlier. The way that you extract value with these games is with Axie Infinity is twofold. So firstly, with the smooth love potions that you earn within the game, those tokens, you can trade those on an exchange. And with the monsters that I was talking about earlier that are NFTs, you can also trade, buy and sell these monster NFTs on NFT marketplaces. So the, those are two methods that you can extract value from, from a play to earn game. 
So another thing I think that will um, take off in the play to earn space is the metaverse. So I think there's probably multiple understandings as to what the metaverse is. Um, so just for these purposes, I think the way that I'm going to describe it is being able to uh, have an interplay between these different virtual worlds where you can purchase certain assets within one world, but then convert them and have them as a usable asset into another virtual world. And that's kind of one of the, the main things I think that the metaverse is trying to achieve. So with this, anything that you buy um, in, in one game, you can use in another game. And the way to do this is to have cross-chain platforms. So there are games now that are actually, that have this functionality where they have um, the tokens that they generate are, um, have the cross-chain capabilities. So one such game is called Alien Worlds where their token can actually be, uh, be transferred onto the WAX blockchain. Ethereum smart contracts and the Binance smart chain as well. So that's almost kind of like teleporting between different chains. Um, and then the last thing I think that I wanted to touch on um, in terms of play to earn is that play to earn is actually also spilling into the decentralized finance market. So it's only recently that you can actually um, use your NFTs, put your NFTs up as collateral for crypto loans, which previously you couldn't do before. You could only do that with fungible tokens and tokens that were usually, if you guys are um, familiar with the crypto market, fungible tokens like Ethereum, um, Solana, things like that. You can do that with NFTs before. So that's another new movement in the NFT market. Um, I'll probably stop here because I feel like I <laughs> could go on. But, um... Thanks, Erika. Um, I'll move on to Luis, as you rightly said in your introduction, um, Brazil is still a grey market and uh, basically there is, this gives opportunities but also creates more complications when it comes to payments. Um, uh, what are the difficulties being faced uh, by the gaming operators there to receive payments from their players? And what innovative payment solutions are you seeing right now developing in, in Brazil for operators to uh, be able to succumb this challenge? Okay, well, thank you. And complications are good opportunities for lawyers, so that's not bad, actually. Um, Brazil is a great market, as explained. Uh, we don't have gambling regulated yet, uh, but we have uh, hundreds of gaming operators offering uh, their service to Brazilian players right now. Uh, and they rely on local payment service providers. The issue is that we have uh, different kinds of payment service providers, uh, and the central bank has uh, regulated that kind of activity very truly. Uh, and recently, they have changed that kind of regulation. So, uh, Last year, about one year ago, the central bank introduced a new uh, method of payment in Brazil called PIX that has practically replaced what we had, one other method that payment that we had called Boleto. Boleto is a payment slip uh, that you need, it's a paper that you needed to print to go to the bank or have the code, a barcode and pay. Uh, even if you didn't print, you needed a barcode to pay, and it took 24 hours or 48 hours to have the compensation uh, and verify payments. Uh, now with PIX, uh, all transfers are instant. You can have the f transfer the funds immediately from the player to the PSP and from the PSP to the player. Uh, and that has changed uh, the payments from Boleto to PIX almost over 95% already. Um, also, uh, the central bank recently introduced, and I mean recently now in October, uh, uh, a resolution that allows payment institutions, those are not banks, those are like digital banks uh, or e-wallets to apply for uh, a foreign exchange uh, license as well. Uh, foreign exchange was uh, a very restricted activity in Brazil for a long time. Uh, only uh, forex brokers and forex banks were authorized to do uh, foreign exchange, and now payment institutions will be authorized to, can be authorized to do so, uh, and that can be a very uh, good game changer for PSPs as well. 
Uh, and when I s explain that we have different kinds of PSPs is because now we have police authorities uh, and the government going after uh, PSPs that are processing payments for the gambling industry in Brazil. Uh, one single PSP had over, over 13 million reais of frozen assets uh, because of one police investigation in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, if, and there is one critical issue uh, that not necessarily all of them uh, complied with. As in Brazil, it's prohibited to uh, make international settlements of credits. So uh, you're ne you necessarily have to remit all the deposits and then make the entrance of the prizes, and you cannot offset those amounts. But now, because of the central bank regulations, uh, you can make uh, a symbolic foreign exchange, uh, paying the uh, tax on financial operations on the difference. You don't have to send the funds, only pay the taxes. Uh, some uh, PSPs are complying with that and some are not. And that may create some liabilities for the gaming operators. Thanks, Luis. Uh, we have one minute, basically, so I'd like a very, very short comment from each of you on how you see uh, things developing uh, in the next uh, few years in the gaming industry when it comes to payments. I will be very brief. I think that the gaming industry will continue embracing the technology. I think there is a section of the players, most probably the millennials, that will look into innovation, will look into um, uh, a number of payment methods that may not be connected in some way to bank accounts. So I think that this is the way to go. Um, uh, and let's embrace technology within the regulatory remit. Luis? Um, I think in Brazil we are about to face the opening of the market. Uh, and once the market opens, uh, payments will be instant with peaks. Uh, we have uh, also, we are also discussing the regulation of blockchain in Brazil. So um, I think payments in Brazil will not be like, for instance, in Colombia, where gaming operators had a hard time opening bank accounts. I think in Brazil it will be much easier. Andreas and Erika, briefly. Yeah, uh, I basically see three things. I see a higher degree of integration of, of blockchain fiat gateways like you guys provide and integration of stable coins. I see uh, smart contract technology being more used within the games and I definitely see the metaverse idea with the NFTs. Uh, I think that's going to be really big combining gaming, gambling, metaverse and, and NFTs. Um, I would agree with Andreas. I think it will be a mix of different um, cryptocurrencies and fiat. Um, I think one of the biggest um, issues that we need to take into consideration is regulatory hurdles, um, especially when you're on-ramping and off-ramping crypto, when it comes to crypto payments. But again, we, we don't really know how that's going to look, but it, it's looking promising anyway in any event. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you very much for following us and uh, enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs> <laughs>